this highlight special of the 9th Forbes Women Africa Leading Women Summit with me, Kamukhetsu Masipili. Every year on the 8th of March, we celebrate International Women's Day to shed light on some of the achievements women across the world have achieved in their parts, from banking to fashion and creative industries and even space. Let's take a look. First of all, how many people are here at the Leading Women's Summit for the first time by a show of hands? Oh, wow. Whoa. Well, that is an incredible new number. New faces. A whole lot of new faces, but I also saw a whole lot of hands that are not down. So for you, you'll probably recognize some of these archives. You could have been in the room, of course, when uh, they were being uh, filmed. For the rest of you, do take pleasure in watching what has been built in the past nine Forbes Women Africa Leading Women Summit. Check it out. goes to Angelique Kijo, Mother Nature. Oh my God. Devastating kick. She opened up a gap that is rarely seen over 800 meters. I've seen the increase of more young people, more young women into ministerial and leadership positions than ever since the 80s. Something great was destined for me. I could, you know, when you just feel like you're an absolute icon, I could feel it. I think my commitment and my dream for this utopia ultimate freedom is for us to have true autonomy and self determination. So when you asked me to do this for caring for women, I said yes because I believe in the power of women people caring for other women people throughout the world. We have the strength, we have the combined greatness of standing together to touch many lives and by standing for those that cannot stand for themselves. We should challenge tradition in which they create that hierarchy in terms of relationship within the family and within, within society. I'm sad because I dare to occupy space confidently and own it. I mean, I've met many powerful and strong but inner strength women and I'm very much attracted to women of strength. You learn from them, you take from them, you observe them, you watch how they speak, the messages they give to the world and basically, you know, for me, I'm always considered myself a work in progress, I'm always learning. I like to learn, yes. We can be activists, we can assert our rights. Not wait and hope someone recognizes I'm an executive. It is important to find what you love to do 
and work tenaciously at it. And we do what we do with passion and heart. At Forbes Africa, we work with ideas, icons, and innovations relentlessly. And creativity is born in moments such as this, the result of long days and longer nights to curate a summit shaping a new discourse for the continent. This here is a room packed with power and purpose as we work on ways, tenaciously, as I said before, to design a better future for all of us. We now look to the keynote address delivered by South African politician and Treasurer General of the Governing African National Congress, Dr. Gwen Ramakopa, as she shares her insights on Africa's plight towards gender equality. The key highlights that I want to leave you with that must inspire us uh, to remember that in my world and in the world of many of us, and maybe that's the real world, there are no glass ceilings. Uh, it is time for women to stand up. It is time to women, and as we rise, we must remember uh, to lift others, as advised by our four, four bearers, uh, like uh, uh, May, uh, Charlotte McQuake, who was one of the women that tested glass ceilings, and when she raised her hand, she found that, no, uh, the air is clear and indeed the sky is the limit. It is important to share with other women that as a woman it's impossible, you can do whatever that you want to do or achieve in life. Power women driving the African agenda. If I take the example of Rwanda, my country, women hold over 60% of parliamentary seats and 50% of cabinet members are women. This is a testament to our country's commitment to gender equality. And this achievement, among others, provides a blueprint for assessing leadership success and empowering more women to take the helm in policy, business, and beyond. I think results matter. And results must be clear, they must be measurable, and we must be able to show to whoever your stakeholders are what results are. So for me, what's really important all the time is to always show significant growth and impact. At the JSE, we have over 50% of our staff being female, more than 50%, 52%. We have 80% of our executive being female mm. and have had more than 60% of our board being female, in fact, closer to 70%. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Absolutely. You have to find the path of least resistance. In that instance where I added my voice to peace mediation between Guyana and Venezuela um, was during a time over the disputed Esquibo oil territory. And I met first with President David Granger of Guyana. And this was after him and President Maduro had already met with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon at the UN. Now, things weren't going too, too well. Um, but I wasn't trying to compete with the UN. What I was trying to do was offer an alternative avenue um, to mediation. So in this case, I found the path of least resistance in my mediation quest. I never wait for change to be given to us. I'm someone who always instigates. So for example, with the Confederation of African um, Football, we just heard from MBA around their 40% um, women ratio. When I came to CAF and issue with 25, um, I'm outgoing in April, we're now at 38, so we're not far behind. Sure. So as a team, we've really tried to push that agenda. In conversation on songs, setbacks, and stardom. I did a show this weekend and I was the only female on the lineup, but I was put on first. And that's not a problem for me. It was a beautiful audience, it was packed at 11 a.m., but the issue for me is there are 10 males in the hotel sleeping mm. that are gonna get up and put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt <laughs> and be okay. Mm. And I'm forced to wake up early, lay my wig, do my makeup, because I can't come on stage without it. Then, mm. then it's gonna be a conversation as we've, mm. we've seen online with other females. It's like, we get called out when we don't look presentable. But at the same time, 
it's not considered. Mm. You know, there's small details, you know, I think we need to continue to reinforce that and, and be okay with that. Making it as a CXO, redefining progress and power. Let me talk about what power means when, when, when you actually get to the office. Um, for me, I see it as a platform. You know, you're in a role where you are the custodian of that organization's values. You're the custodian of the culture of that organization. And you have the ability uh, to actually use your voice to champion activities. You know, whether it's around women empowerment being, being one of the key things, uh, you have the ability to also align resources around it. But power is not just about having a title and saying people need to do. You need to be able to convince people of the value, and you really need to understand what is, what is driving people. Mm. And you know, how do you enable that journey? Power is very subjective. Uh, it's how you influence others. So whether you're a social media influencer, whether you're a CEO, CFO, um, and power to me is not just about the title. As a founding uh, partner of a business, the title I gained it the moment I started my business. Mm. So you found a business and you become the CEO of your own company. Mm. So back then I would not have defined power the way I see it today. Uh, because for me it was just a title. Uh, right now where I see it, it's not just a title. It's an and title. For me, it's about what do you do with the voice that you've got? Because once you reach a certain level, and it's a level that's not quite determined by yourself, it's actually a level determined by others as powerful, as authoritative. Because some people, of course, can have the ego to think that they are powerful, when in fact nobody takes them seriously or rates mm. them. Mm. So once you reach that level, how do you utilize it? And you need to be responsible enough to understand that what you do, what you say, how you behave in your conduct matters disproportionately. Mm. Because something that comes from my mouth can build or break easier than the same words coming from somebody's mouth who is viewed to be junior or not as powerful. This is something that has really taken me through the 30 years that I've been in a male-dominated uh, industry. So this ball is a rubber band elastic ball. And when I started off, it was flimsy, it couldn't bounce. And as I went through uh, my career, uh, through the years, I, every time I went through a challenge, every time I went through a hardship, every time I, I had to work harder than I ever did before, I would add just one elastic band to this ball. Over the years, this ball has become quite strong, and it, has, it, it now bounces back, and it bounces back quite high. So I think I want to encourage each and every one of you to please make yourself an elastic rubber band ball and bounce back with resilience and with confidence and own it. Thank you. Every year, the Forbes Woman Africa Leading Women Summit features the poignant and moving in the spotlight segment. In 2024, nine prominent and pioneering women shared their stories. <laughs> That was the song I opened with on the competition at Sing China, hundreds of millions of views worldwide. Where I come from, being considered a woman of impact, impacting the globe, the community, is far-fetched, to say the least. <laughs> For an African woman, there is nothing that is impossible. The only way to overcome your fears is to have the courage to move through them. I'm Amata Mata, I'm an actress, and I'm a proud African woman. I am Michaela Klein Smith, a singing songwriter from Cape Town, South Africa. <laughs> and I'm here to show you that dreams are achievable, no matter how great. And I am a proud African woman. Thank you. Hello. 
I'm a 15 year old from South Africa. My name is Alba Foster, and I am proud to be an African woman. I drew on my strength as a woman, and previous experiences, trials, and tribulations took that microphone, and my face, my voice, was the symbol of South Africa's greatest sports tragedy the day that 43 faithful fans lost their lives. My name is Carol Shabalala, the first lady of sport, and I am a proud African woman. My name is Nirere Chanel. I am a Rwandan artist and a very proud African woman. So I stand here today, an award-winning three-time essay breaking <laughs> champ <laughs> with profiles and documentaries on platforms from CNN to DSTV. I've turned my passions into paychecks and toured the world DJing, choreographing, and performing on some of the biggest stages alongside some of the biggest artists. Yeah. I run an entertainment company that's one of the sponsors for this event today. <laughs> and I'm also on the journey to qualifying for the 2024 Olympic Games. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I stand here today being loved for all the things society taught me I'd be hated for. I stand here today still different, still a misfit, but so proud. Yes. My name is Courtney Paul, and I'm a proud, proud African woman. This was the song that I would sing to soothe myself after what I call the most tragic event happened to me was when I lost my mother, Hawamaina, seven years ago and I was nine months pregnant. Today, this actress's daughter is an internationally renowned poet, a multi-award winning poet, Gates Foundation's goalkeeper, UN peacekeeping ambassador, and the global lead and founder for Creative Cultural Revival. And I stand before you, nothing short of a very proud African woman. My name is Alhan Islam, and thank you so much for having me. Today I find myself in many other kinds of war rooms, and it is the same faith in God's strength and resilience that I use to be able to fight them from the streets of Lubumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo to the stage of Forbes today. My name is Gail Matumbu Munai. I stand here. I stand here today, a wife, mother of three beautiful children, and six angels in heaven. A multi-award winning business leader, a fierce survivor, and I am a proud African woman. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our In the Spotlight Speakers, a round of applause!
sporting women changing the game in every field. In terms of um, how things have changed in the world of athletics, how things changed for you when you came into the world of athletics, um, how was your world changed by becoming an Olympian? Being involved, you know, in this, you know, sports, you know, world of sports, and then you come in and then you have to feel like you do not belong. Uh, it goes back where you, you look back where, you know, your parents have raised you. Uh, they've raised me to be a better person, but coming into learning human behavior, I think it's played a vital role because I had to learn how to mute. I had, I had to learn how to, you know, distance myself from things that I cannot control. But what I can say is that the world of sports um, have told me to understand the importance of uh, human rights and treating people with respect, celebrating them, um, accepting people for their differences, yeah. I worked for Touchline Media and I think working for a company that's sports related, I think it allowed me to be able to go and play for the national team. Yes, I had to take unpaid leave, but it allowed me to go and play and make sure that I come back and have a job. I think over the years it has changed, not too much. You still have some girls uh, having a nine to five job and then going to training with their clubs. The only teams currently uh, that you can say are full time are the teams attached to the professional teams like Mamelodi Sundowns, TS Galaxy and Royal AM. Um, university students on the other hand, uh, obviously, you know, they study, but I know of players playing in the national team that have gone to the World Cup that have a nine to five job. So that hasn't changed. And the cry was after doing so well at the World Cup was to get a professional league going because we're going to sit here 2027 when the next World Cup comes around and we're going to speak the same story. So the message has always been to urge sponsors to come on board so that females can also, you know, have a career in South Africa. In conversation, front row, the Forbes Woman Africa interview. So uh, tell us, Sabrina, you're smart, you're driven, you're inspiration, inspirational, you walk the runways of major fashion shows. You also have a movie career. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that first film you did and what you have on the Oh my the gosh, cards? that's so funny. Actually, the first show I ever did, <laughs> I was like 20, and I did this audition called in the house, and um, I got like a small lead on a couple episodes with Flavor Flav, like so random. But he had this little sitcom for a while, and I tried to tell Idris that when I met him, like, oh, I've acted before. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually went to acting school for a while before university, so I do love the craft. I, and I have received a master class over the last couple of years. You would not believe because I've been on set with him and I've got to see how directors work intimately. And so I have kind of fallen a bit in love with it again. Um, and I did a small film with him, of just like a tiny part called 3000 Years of Longing. And still, every time I see myself in that film, I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh. Like, but I, I, I actually, I, I love film. I mean, that's for us, it's like the best perfect night. Sitting on a couch, putting on the TV, watching a movie together. It's hard to watch movies with him because he just like dissects everything. He's like, oh, the camera didn't catch that. <laughs> or the, I'm like, shh, I'm in the moment. <laughs> Stop talking. And you met him when he was shooting, when he was filming The Mountain Between Us with Kate Winslet. Yeah, that's so in funny. In a jazz bar. Because he was making yeah. a movie about falling in love while we were falling in, in love. love. That's fantastic. And it's so funny. And sometimes I would think, these are such great lions. Is he taking these from the movie? <laughs> What do you love about this oh, country? I love South <laughs> Africa. No, I, lo I, I honestly, I think the way South Africa has been so accepting of Idris and, and has put Idris on this like sort of platform, um, you've shown so much love to him and really, really Joburg is in his heart. It honestly is. And I think um, it makes me love it even more. I spent all day yesterday at like Woolies and Pick and Pay and because you have the best snacks. Like, I'm not kidding, I'm taking back speckled eggs by the pound. <laughs> They're so good. And I was like, people like, don't realize how good the food in South Africa is overall, but the snacks, mm. and chakalaka. <laughs> so good. Right, we do hope that next time you will be able to come with the, in fact, when you said there will be a plus one, I half hoped. 
yeah. it would be Mr. Idris Elba. But <laughs> no, we have to come time. back together. He's definitely a bit jealous I'm here. So Great. Oh, he's back. jealous that she's here. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, ladies Thank and gentlemen. You. That's Sabrina Elba. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. My journey to outer space. As you're looking at humanity from outside Earth, how has your experience um, shaped the way you view the future of our society um, and also the future of our continent? So um, I was sent to space to analyze something called the overview effect, which is this change of perspective that happens to you when you see Earth from space. And as an engineer, I'm also a skeptic, but also very open to changing my mind about everything. Because yes, you have to. You have to be open to getting the data and making your own opinion about whatever you're getting. So when I, was sent, when I went to space and I saw Earth from space, it turned out to be a lot more profound than I thought it was going to be. It really does change your perspective on the scale of the world, on the interconnectedness of humanity between itself and humanity and the rest of the world and humanity and the universe. So you get this new perspective of the borders don't really exist. So there is a few points to it. And it took me a while to be able to explain this. When I came back, it just everything felt so weird and I couldn't really understand why I was feeling this way. So I had to, as an engineer, write it down in bullet points, <laughs> of course, just breaking down, try to understand, so why am I feeling this way? And it is the overview effect, and it's always going to be different for different people. And because I was the first one from this side of the world to have done it, I've only heard people from the West talk about the overview effect. So I was wondering, would it be different? But we don't know. We don't have enough data yet, so we need to be sending more people from our side of the world to really be able to understand what these effects are. So for instance, you hear a lot of astronauts talk about the lack of borders. You know, when you see Earth from space, there are no borders on the map. And they've actually been, if you look at what's actually how these borders have been made, there were some men centuries ago sitting in a room and just splitting countries. Yeah. They split Africa this way. They split Europe. They split the whole world, Asia, everything. So how does that make sense? And how are these lines that were drawn by these old white men in a room, you know, how are these lines dictating all everything that we can or cannot do in our lives? The future is here. How will AI change the workforce? If you think of the roles of the future, it's those that are the creative genius of today that will create the roles of the future, and those that really want to solve problems that will create the roles of the future. Unfortunately, I cannot predict it because AI is evolving so quick, so fast, and we're really just adopting it right now. How can we use AI? to mitigate against unconscious bias and to push proactively the woman agenda? For me, the answer is very simple. Um, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zindi, which is the largest platform for data scientists, AI practitioners, and developers in Africa. We have 70,000 young people who are on our platform, upskilling every day, finding jobs, and of those 70,000, there's 20,000 women on the platform who are wow. doing this. That's so amazing. the simple answer is actually representation. It's actually making sure that the people who are able to make decisions, who are responsible for making decisions, have a space at that table where those decisions are being made. And that's our goal at Cindy. How would you say companies can best fight against this fear of AI and get the workforce to truly adapt and integrate and, what's the word, embrace? AI. I think, I mean, if we look at these beautiful cars on the left, I implore you to look at them. You look at the AI that we are developing in our cars, and you're 100% right, we use AI all the time. We develop two different elements. One is for our employees to how do we better their efficiency? How do we ensure that they spend the right time doing the right things with data and analytics that ensures that we're making the right corporate strategic decisions powered by data rather than emotion? And I think that's fundamental. And how do we take the staff members on that journey? You look at our vehicles and we say, how do we make the comfort for our customers better? How do I know that all five of us sitting here today, we operate differently. We look at different things when we switch on our cars. We like to touch different things. We like to sit in different positions. Our cars have hyperlayers and zero layers that knows when I log in, that's me. 
it's driving, it changes my seat, it puts on my favorite radio station, it tells me where I'm going because it knows it's Monday morning at eight o'clock or seven o'clock and I'm going to the office. How do we then now take the, the journey between the staff member, the business, and the goals? Mm -hmm. It's about embracing them, getting them on board, and explaining that the decisions that we are making are goal-driven, are to, to put them in the forefront, to allow them the time to do the right things. Instead of spending eight, nine hours, and I'm sure everyone in this audience has spent many hours looking at Excel spreadsheets, pulling data from different sources and really analyzing it, when you could have spent an hour doing that with the right data set and spend the other eight hours actually analyzing the data to understand that you're making the right business decisions and informed decisions to become a lot more efficient. When you say a purpose through inclusive technology, it's really building platforms and systems that have an appreciation of where our customers come from, understand who they are, and the use of these technologies is at the heart of that. You couldn't be able to predict the behaviors of our customers without the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera. So that business case has been made. We're not sitting here arguing if it will help us reach our business capabilities. We know that's the case. Now, at African Bank, we call ourselves African Bank for the people. It's exactly that element. Using these technologies in such a way that we can deliver better to our customers. That's one part. But we also say for the people, by the people. And we're talking specifically, Tanya, about our workforce. So our workforce, I, and I know, I mean, uh, we all work in different organizations here. And this element of new technologies can bring a little bit of anxiety. Mm. It can bring a level of intimidation as well. From where I sit, it's, it's a good challenge. It's a unique challenge. In fact, if you didn't have your strategy rooted at something that's gonna impact for the good, something that's for the society, you could use AI in whichever way to achieve good or bad. So at African Bank, we are determined. Not only are we prepared, we will, we are using AI to better our services and products to our customers. We are using AI to enhance the work that our workforce is doing. Shaping your own destiny. It's all about second chances. And I think it's so easy if we compare someone else's year five with your day one. I want to be Miss South Africa. I want to be here. I want to be working, giving opportunity, being the link, going to the schools, be tangible to younger girls. And for so many people out there, the public fought against it almost when I won. Like, what's her value if she's not going overseas? Like, she's not representing us, so like, why is she Miss South Africa? Showing to people that it's service above self. I don't want to be envied. I want to be relatable. And standing here today gave me the opportunity to really open up and show people that being Miss South Africa is, yes, it's really nice to also put the nice suits on. But it's really giving that girl child a story to go back to and say, this is normal. This is okay. I can still be Miss South Africa and go through all of these challenges. In between the riveting and inspirational stories of triumph and success told by some of the world's most influential women, we spoke to some of the partners of the 2024 Leading Women Summit who played an integral role in breathing life into this successful event message that I wish to drive home I think what I've learned what I'm learning from all the panels is that failure it's okay to fail it's okay to fail you know you will make it again you know resilience you know having watched Natasha's um, discussion now I mean that was also empower, empowering having listened to Ama like all of these points are just so relevant to what we deal with because once we fail we don't know how to get out of it we always think that um, you know the next person is going to do better than I actually put up a quote just now on my uh, whatsapp status you know on what she says that I cannot be worried about somebody who's been doing it five days versus me who's 
doing it from day one, you know. I always have to look at myself and believe in myself no matter what. So I think, um, you know, women can really do a lot when they work together. Um, someone in the panel even said that, you know, imagine the things that can come out if, you know, women at the top are opening the door for others to come in. And I, that's a statement I really resonate with. And so I think I'd like to implore the women at the top to support Hipachi because through doing that, you know, we'll be able to open up a world of opportunities for, um, you know, the up and coming, um, whether it's artists or businesswomen as well. So McDonald's South Africa has been around for about 29 years now. And when you look at the complement of women within our organization, more than 60% complement of women in our organization. So it is very important that we are very inclusive and very sensitive to that complement of staff that we have so that not only do the women feel comfortable within an environment, but also the men feel comfortable in an environment that has got such a huge complement of women. And all the women in our in our organization are allow are not uh, are in the different uh, levels of the organization. Uh, so it's very important to always have that flow to ensure that at any point in time we can access the best talent uh, in our organization. Obviously, given the majority being women, it will mean women. Yeah. I'm very fortunate in that I work for an organization that really enables women empowerment. If you look at just our sub-Saharan Africa office, we're more than 50% female. If you look at our top leadership, we are majority also uh, female. Uh, there are multiple programs that we have on inclusion and diversity. You know, it's one thing including uh, gender diversity. Uh, uh, it, it's another thing being able to give uh, women a voice. And we know that this is an area where women struggle with, you know. How do I find the confidence to speak? You know, how do I find the confidence to make my point of view? And these are some of the more practical things we try and enable through work as senior women to draw in, you know, more, uh, more, more junior people and give them the confidence to speak. As African Bank, we truly believe that women are critical to the success of African Bank and to the success of our country. Forbes naturally is a leader in terms of acknowledging women's contributions and ensuring that even content that celebrates them is really put out there. And so African Bank wanted to partner with Forbes uh, to say, you know what, women, we recognize you too, we acknowledge your contribution. And as African Bank, we truly believe that as a bank for the people, by the people, serving the people, we are a key partner in your development. Forbes Africa, over 30, under 50. You give us Sibalicious recipes in the kitchen, can you give us Sibalicious recipes for life? The tips I can say is that it, I don't often have the balance, and that's okay. And there are times where I feel I'm on top of things, and that's okay too. And I say that because um, being having chosen both career and uh, being a family person does come with its, it's not challenges per se, but it's just sacrifices. Mm. And the sacrifices is uh, being able to work a lot longer hours than majority of people and having to grow a form of resilience and tenacity um, to make sure that you are able not to fall or break down when the demands are so much. I do have a very good relationship with my husband where when he knows I'm here, he takes the kids, all four of them, for a drive or to an indoor park or anywhere so I can sleep. What kept you going, number one? And what is still keeping you going? Even though I did uh, such a big song, Jerusalem, that is loved by uh, many, you know, because I don't know whether it's because I'm a woman, so I, I, I was suppressed in a way, but then I did not give up. Uh, I think it's also because I'm a praying woman. I believe that even though things are not mm. going well, I still need to go in my corner and uh, contact God, that God, you're the one who, who knows everything. Mm -hmm. um, industry, too, it's not an easy industry. I know someone who's sitting here will be like, ah, in 2024, how can you be still crying and all of that? Not understanding that even if you sign that contract, uh, like say the company is giving you maybe 20%, they might not give you that 20% that you agreed on. So it's not always a matter of signing 
like reading uh, our contract. Um, there's a lot that is happening, hence now I've got my own record recording label uh, with the aim of... Uh, <laughs> with the aim of helping the young ones who want to be in this industry because uh, I didn't get a fair deal, so I want to give them a fair deal because uh, there's a lot that is happening. In conversation, women's leadership in crises and conflicts. Tell me, you know, what our impression of Ukraine is very much driven by what we read about it. You know, we hear, we, we hear the sounds of the shelling. We can actually imagine what's happening there. But you're on the ground. You told me 10 minutes ago that your house was, uh, it was fired at three weeks ago. Yes, it's how it's looked like now. Kiev uh, attack mostly each week. And that means that your usual life, when you plan to go to work or you plan to put your children at school or, or for example, you plan to go to, I don't know, barbershop or something like this, um, sometimes you need to stop because in that moment from territory of Belarus, it's near the Russian Federation, uh, fly up so-called MiG. It's such uh, a special military plane who have a rocket in their board. So, so that means you have a 20 minute to find your shelter. And after this, it's not mean that object where you need to go <laughs> exists. So yes, three weeks before two rockets uh, come like fall near the my house at the middle of Kiev. You know, to understand that it's like place where the restaurant's still going, children going to school, university works. And uh, uh, sure, it's, it's absolutely strange situation. But for, now, for us, it's a situation of surviving. Yes. And uh, fighting for our values. It's one of them, it's independency and democracy. That's why we are fighting. Redefining and integrating generational dynamics. I'm keen to understand from your perspective, coming from a family-owned business, yet building and crafting your own career, what key nuances stand out for you in terms of establishing or the lessons that you've le learned from, from that particular background? So I think the first thing is to understand like my family, the work they've done, what the business is about, and really respect that they have built this business and they do have experience. And I think whether I have my own career or join the family to really learn from them, witness what they do. That's the first one. I also think communication. I think trying to understand what they're doing, trying to understand what they want me to do and what, what will make them proud, as well as trying to explain what matters to me and why is like what keeps the discussions going, whether I do my own thing, join my business. Mm. And the last thing I think is to stay involved with the family, whether it's in the business, whether it's in the charitable initiatives, whether it's like even planning family things together. Mm -hmm. It's to kind of be involved and keep the family together because that will be the next generation. I'd like to come to you, Vanessa, as well, just purely given that you also come from a fairly similar background to Ayushi, given that uh, your dad introduced you to uh, the world of hospitality and tourism in terms of entrepreneurship, but you've crafted your own path as well, still wearing the uh, corporate hat in terms of coming from a background as a chartered accountant and working in financial services. Key nuances that stand out for you, especially being a corporate leader who views family businesses as well from that lens? So I think I'm very fortunate to have had both the hats and I still play in both the spaces. Uh, I, f I find it particularly challenging when you do look at you know, your family business and you go, Sherbet, do I really want to do this? And I think that's a challenge that I think we're going to see many generations experience. Sure, do I really want to follow in my father's steps? Do I really want to follow in, in the business that has always been there? So I think that's one of the big fundamental challenges you're going to see. I think the other thing um, that we've all experienced, we had COVID and that brought about uh, a sense of, okay, we're not invincible. We may not be here tomorrow. So how do we start thinking about succession planning in all of our family and our businesses, and how do we fast track that? I don't think there's ever been a time uh, as, as critical as now to consider that. A family business doesn't mean a family has to work in the business. It's who's controlling from an ownership point of view. And it's about getting the best person in each of the roles to run the business, the governance, 
the ownership, and also the connectivity of the family. So it's very important, and I think more and more businesses are starting to see that as the next generations are coming to the fore, what role they want to play. Management lessons from the flight deck. Attention, this is the captain speaking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking. When I came on the stage, that's when people say, enjoy your trip. Uh, <laughs> speaking, because the number one lesson, management technique and the flight deck is powerful communication. He announced to a whole jumbo load of passengers, he said, the co-pilot is Jane Trembath, but don't worry, I won't let her touch anything. I would find I had a co-pilot who, he, he told me to my face, he felt I should go back to my empty kitchen. When you want to change behavior, then you have to address the behavior, not the person. One day, a ground engineer, he said to me, hey, Captain, he said, enjoy your flight, but don't drive like a woman. Wow. I turned around and I said to him, that wasn't very polite. And I'd hit upon the right technique because he was all apologetic and he, he backpedaled, and, but we still parted friends. Because if I'd said to him, you are not very polite, it would have led to bad feelings. So ladies, with powerful communication, you can command your life like the captain of a 747. And with that, you're cleared for takeoff. <laughs>
I think it's a lot to do with collaboration with women, right? Because um, I'm a music producer and a composer, right? So I work with a lot of women in the space of music. Um, I think, I think the, the, the way to kind of push it forward is sort of giving co-signs to women. So as a, as a music producer, when I get into a studio with an artist, it's, it's, a, it's daunting, it's really like, because you want to get in there and play them something that they like, and, and there's like a, it's a room full of people that you're trying to impress. Um, so I can imagine as a woman, it's, it could even be worse. So I think as, as male music producers or composers, giving, giving a woman a cosign. In conversation, holding the Grammy and striving for more. Tyler, great to have you uh, with us at the 2024 Forbes Women Africa Leading Women Summit. You've just received a Grammy. What does it feel like? What was that moment of receiving the trophy and holding it in your hands and facing the world stage? I can't even explain the feeling that I had. Like, I, like leading up to that moment, like that day getting ready and everything, I was kind of... I feel like God gave me a level of peace, but I was still so nervous and unsure like where it would go that night. And when I heard my name, like it took a while to click, but when it did, like, I feel like I was just walking. Like, I don't even remember how I got on the stage and everything, like it was a lot, but yeah, like when I got to the mic, my whole notes that I had prepared in case went away. And I just spoke from my heart and yeah, it was such a, a a proud moment for me and for like my country and my continent. Um, and being the first person ever to win that category, like it was such a big night for African music. And I'm just so happy that I was able to take that home for us, you know? Sexism, money and power. What lies beneath? Kenya right now is leading, I think, in women in boards, which is at 36% um, compared to 24 um, on, on the African continent. Again, women in the C-suite um, is, is quite a large percentage. What, what really hasn't shifted much is at the lower cadre, we're still very, very female dominated, of course. Okay. Yeah. The, um, as funny as this, we're living in a fluid uh, generation when it comes to sex itself, but when it comes to acquiring things, we are still stuck on if you work hard and you're smart enough, then you're less feminine. And I think the society have robbed themselves of great women like Nina Simones and Winnie Mandela's and Miriam McKeever. When you read their stories, they were still being denied to, seen, to be seen as what they contribute with in whatever that they were doing. And the society was robbed into learning and receiving those contributions. I'm gonna take my savings. My husband didn't want to finance it. I took my savings to go back to school full time with 18 years old girls to study that. And look at you now. <laughs> so that's why I think what is very important for me, even if it's not in the subject, I mean, I'm sure there are some women here, like you can be married, you can have kids. I went back to university. My, my younger daughter was one year and a half. Uh, I was uh, at school during the day, taking care of the house, uh, and then at night I was studying to catch up with those 18 years ago. And um, it's never too late to, to follow your dream and to accomplish it. And you will prove them wrong with time. My stroke of luck. I had a stroke two years ago in March, 2022. I was traveling to Germany and I had a show. It caused me to close one of my eyes while I was walking, uh, taking in uh, the sights in uh, Frankfurt. And the feeling lasted about 15 minutes and I went to a restaurant which was empty. And then I approached the waiters and tried to speak.
I couldn't speak. And I had to learn talking as a child. A, E, I, O, U. And learn to put those words together. Cat, hello, hi, love. It took me a while to learn that. But when the doctors told me I could learn speaking, it's going to take about two years or five years. But I had hope. I had hope. I had hope. I had nothing to worry about. I was at peace and I had no anxiety and I was not stressed. That's why I'm recovering so well because stress was not there. I've learned that when you go through things, they are happening for you. My stroke is a stroke of luck. And that's how we wrap up the ninth edition of the Forbes Woman Africa Leading Woman Summit. From me, Kiamrit Zomasapili, it's goodbye for now, and I hope to see you again next year. Thank you.